Uh, my name is Don Taylor, and I want to welcome everybody to the middle grades uh, conversation. Uh, today, we're going to continue talking about equity, social justice, and anti-racist education, and what folks are doing uh, in their practices to either learn about that or to implement uh, changes uh, in the way they're teaching. And essentially, this is going to be a roundtable discussion uh, where we gather and hear from one another and hear how folks are doing. Uh, just one um, word that this is recorded and it will be posted uh, on our Middle Grades Conversations, Middle Grades Collaborative YouTube channel. Uh, and also, um, we're going to kind of see how it's going to work in terms of format. I think uh, we'll end up having a roundtable uh, discussion. Um, but I just want to uh, put in the chat, I've started with a little introduction uh, order, and people can just kind of fill in after that. Uh, and before we start, this work is sponsored by the Middle Grades Collaborative and the Tarrant Institute for Education, and we often partner with Up for Learning. And thanks, everybody, for being here. I know we're all looking forward to the Thanksgiving break, uh, but it's good to get together and hear from one another. So, uh, Monica, do you want to introduce yourself, and then I'll update the, or the order of introductions in the chat. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Don. Hi. Uh, great to see many of you. Um, I'm Monica McInerney. I'm an associate professor of education at Castleton University. And um, I have invited today uh, several students who are in my equity and learning for pre-service educators uh, course. It's just a few of us. Um, this is the first time I've taught the course. And uh, we've been learning together, um, really digging into, of course, um, Gorski's framework and, uh, and all kinds of things <laughs> regarding um, equity and anti-racist education. So we're so ha happy to be here today. And Don, thank you so much for uh, the email alerting us that this was happening today. We usually meet from two to, uh, from two to 3.15. And so we're meeting a little bit later today, but I'm very happy to have my, some of my students here and I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, Andreas? Yeah. Um, so like, uh, like my professor said, I'm a professor or I'm a, I'm a student through, uh, through, of the ed equity class. Um, it was kind of offered to me as an elective and I kind of just had a general interest because I'm taking a couple of civil rights class in tangent. So I kind of was just interested in where this goes. I am a history major in tangent with Life, pursuing my licensure for uh, middle level. So, awesome! Welcome, Jamie. Hi, my name is Jamie. Um, I'm also an MDS major. Um, I'm not pursuing licensure right now, but I am applying for some grad school opportunities in the fall, as well as um, a teaching job in Spain. My main focus is bilingual education and bicultural education. So I'm looking forward to learning today. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, Kevin Pilly Hunt. I am a 5A journalist on Swift House at Williston Central School and welcome to all of our guests today. It's good to see you all. Hi there, I am Meg O'Donnell. I teach humanities to seventh and eighth graders at Shelburne Community School. Good to see you all. Maura? Hi everyone, I'm Maura Wheeler. I'm the proficiency-based learning and technology integration coach um, at Lamoille South Unified Union. Um, it's so nice to see everyone and to have some pre-service teachers with us today. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Yes, ditto that. It's great to see some new faces. Um, I'm Sarah Popowitz. I am a program director for Up for Learning. And before that, I was a classroom teacher, science teacher in um, middle level for about 20 years. All right, Heidi. Hi, I'm Heidi Waddell. I am a Castleton student in Monica's equity class. I'm an MDS major um, and hoping to get my licensure in K through six um, uh, teaching certificate. 
All right, thank you. And I think we have one more guest. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Michaela. Um, I'm also a Kasten student. Um, I'm an MDS major with a concentration in history and um, special ed endorsement. All right. Uh, well, welcome everybody. It's real. It is good to uh, have some new faces and hear from uh, some new perspectives. Um, one of the things I think we're going to move to the roundtable discussion uh, prompts. And the first prompt that we talked about uh, was last month. Contributor spoke of the idea that social justice should not just be an add-on or something extra, but fully integrated into our curriculum. And are there any uh, classroom teachers or uh, education? Uh, experts uh, on the panel who could sort of give an example of how they're integrating social justice into the curriculum uh, fully and maybe uh, just provide uh, some successes and challenges of what that looks like in your classroom or within your program. And uh, I'm just going to let people raise their hand and kind of address that if they can. Uh, if there's anybody who wants to start us off, um, take it away. I can call on people too. Kevin, why don't you start us off? You thought I haven't been on Zoom. I was like looking for the hand raise button and it was gone. So here, here I am. Thank you, Don. Um, a couple of things we do on Swift House. Um, well, first, uh, I think it was like four or five years ago now, we spent a week at MGI and decided as a team that um, sustainability was going to be just part of our curriculum instead of an extra unit that we do. Uh, so that's something that, you know, the UN SDGs, which obviously have that environmental side to them, as well as the social side to, to equity, um, it's something that we've ingrained just into our regular curriculum. So it's one of our core classes that our students take. Um, typically, just kind of the, the, the short summary of, of how it goes, you know, we spend most of the fall unpacking the global goals and getting into some of the, the community issues and ideas. And then our students brainstorm some project ideas. Um, and like today, we actually just had our big survey where kids picked, you know, out of 20 potential like action projects and groups you know, they chose their top four. And then we're going to sort them into these small groups that they'll be working, working with throughout the remainder of the year, developing community partners and, and really thinking about what's, you know, what's some action research that they can, that they can get into um, by June. And, and, you know, we're, we're taking some things from like Sarah and Lindsay from up for learning with the, the YPAR model and, and, probably going to be reaching out to you too, Sarah, about community partners and connections. Um, but it's just a great opportunity for them to dive into some of those social issues uh, and things that are meaningful for them. Um, so that's one way uh, that we're addressing this. It's just part of our curriculum. Um, another thing that we do uh, more so in humanities, it definitely comes up in our other core classes, but you know, when I, you know, we always have to address our learning scales and learning targets, but what we're grateful for is we're very flexible with the content that we use. So, you know, throughout the entire fall, like we are just social justice, like everything that we do comes back to a social justice themed um, unit. And, and, you know, we're, we're connecting past to present, you know, we're using a lot of just current events, um, working with our students, thinking about what injustices are they seeing and, and how can we uplift? Um, how can we be activists? So we do a lot of work on studying different activists and activism in general and what they can do as middle schoolers to become activists. So we've had a lot of success with that just because Again, like, especially at this age, fifth through eighth grade, on our team anyway, we're fifth through eighth grade. These kids are really ready to have these conversations and talk about um, these bigger issues in our, in our world and, and things that they're seeing too and changes they wanna make around you know, their own local communities. So whenever we're doing any of our work, um, it, it, it really is grounded in social justice. And we, we typically lean on um, those learning for justice, the, teaching, the old teaching tolerance uh, standards um, you know, looking at, at having those as like our anchor that we come back to. Um, and, and it's, it's, you know, Don, you know, things that we've taken from you, it's just constantly getting feedback from kids too. And just saying like, Hey, what matters to you right now? What are some things that you want to explore? Um, that's, that's really been, been helpful, you know, in terms of challenges, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> keep, keeping everything together sometimes at the middle school level and, and making sure that, we are offering enough voice and choice in the matter um, is finding that appropriate balance, especially with like the fifth and sixth graders and what, what we're asking them to do um, compared to the seventh and eighth graders. 
Thank you very much, Kevin. Does anybody else uh, want to talk about how they're incorporating uh, these ideas into the classroom? Meg? Sure, sure. Uh, happy to, Don. Thanks. Um, uh, so I'm on a four-person team and of seventh and eighth graders, and two of us teach humanities. And so Wendy and I, um, is my she's my teammate who also teaches humanities. And um, our approach is uh, really we're both integrated at the same time. So we're, we're either embedding literacy into a, um, uh, whether we're heavy literacy fo focused or heavy um, more like um, uh, social study, I guess, focused. Um, but really it's, it's pulled together at the same time. And we operate under an overarching question for our um for our year and then try to break it down into a semester so overarching question for this year is how does place identity and society shape our understanding and our purpose in the world and so each trimester we we pull down a focus for that and so this trimester she's reading the outsiders and doing some work on um society and the tensions that exist in socioeconomic situations and I'm focused on the social identities and um, students right now um, have identified like I've done a lot of work identifying the different different social identities and right now they're um, they have created um, for lack of a, like speeches where they're advocating for change in how we address stereotypes and bias in our communities. And so um, we've used a ton of resources from Facing History. And then um, one of the things I was thinking about, the struggle, I think always when we're, um, when we're doing any work is how do you bring closure to something without losing that thread, right? Like, like I don't want to end this work on um, social identities. We're gonna pull this through into um, our next work, which will be around uh, conflict uh, and looking at historic conflicts, but, um, but always keeping that thread of uh, who whose voices were telling the stories, whose voices are absent from those histories. Um, uh, what are the, uh, misconceptions that are out there, whose voices have been silenced. And so um, doing identity work I, is so exciting. It's so fitting for middle level kids. They just love it. They love trying to understand themselves and their place in the world. And then knowing how um, those identities interplay. Um, I think they I think one of the conceptions that we had at the beginning was that everything had a separate column and really it's all very, um, our identities are, are muddy and they're fluid and they change depending on the circumstances. And that was, I think, a pretty significant aha for them. So uh, the challenges are always time and, um, and uh, just keep maintaining student engagement and enthusiasm was something. Um, two days before break, <laughs> and, um, and then picking up those meaningful threads when, uh, when we continue with the work. So I'll let you know how it goes when we come back. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Meg. Uh, Maura, I see you have your hand raised. So many months of Zoom, right? So I can't find the unmute. Um, I was just going to say, uh, we, I work with two middle schools and um, they have sort of like taken on different ways of really centering social justice in their work. Um, at one of our middle schools, we have teams who've been really focused on um, all teachers of the team um, teach a section of the language arts class. And so they're really focused on um, transforming their language arts class um, to be really centered around social justice. And so looking at the texts that they're using, sort of the essential questions of the work around um, language arts, because that's sort of where they can collaborate the most as a team and ensure sort of like all students have that um, experience. And um, a group of those teachers also are leading um, professional development for teachers sort of like across um, the district. Um, some of that work started last year. 
um, which is really um, quite exciting. And then we also have other um, teams who have a different configuration to teach out of a humanities model, similar to what Meg was um, explaining. And, and they, um, and those teams of teachers are, they're four person teams and they're really thinking about how they integrate it across all four teachers in the content areas. And so it's sort of different by the configuration of the teams. Um, but I would say some um, real strengths is that um, when it's centered and when it's really like the central part of the curriculum, um, it's so much more meaningful and engaging for the students. They're really looking for us to have these conversations and really looking for us to um, hold space for students um, to critically engage and sort of like grapple with what's happening in their world um, and, and to really look at um, history with a critical lens. And so um, we found that it's been a really powerful um, opportunity and also thinking about um, even in sort of some more like non-academic settings, the advisory program um, at one of our middle schools has really centered cent uh, social justice in their work and in their advisory practices. And so I think sometimes when we think about centering social justice, we, we tend to think about like what's happening in our social studies or global citizenship class or what, you know, what books are being read or what does it, the display look like in the library? But there are a lot of other areas in the school, such as like advisory programs that really can be anchored in in social justice and be really transformative. And so um, I think in that way, that's exciting and powerful work um, and really helps to, to push schools forward. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, thanks. Um, so just for like some quick background up for learning, the work that we do um, consulting with youth and adult teams from across Vermont and and now outside of Vermont and even some global teams um, is always rooted in the idea of youth adult partnerships and um, really having uh, youth and adults at the table together um, to make decisions to, to um, address what's happening, to talk about and reimagine education for all um, in the classroom and um, throughout schools and throughout the communities. And so really everything everyone has said are, are components that we work on, um, you know, whether there's a sustainability focus or a restorative practices focus or a social justice focus. In the end, um, every single one of those pieces is really rooted in relationships <laughs> and building community and having every single individual feel heard and noticed and recognized for who they are. Um, especially like Meg talking about the identity piece, right? And so if we're doing that and we are um, in a place of shared power and responsibility, shared voice, um, respect, if all of those things are sort of rooted together, and then we are also helping teach um, like dialogue, how to have conversations, how to talk to each other respectfully, how to listen, how to have empathy. Um, as you're doing all of those pieces in the end, like that is a social justice curriculum, right? Like all of those pieces are what build social justice curriculum. And, uh, and it really just comes down to those basics of, of teaching how to be in relationship with your fellow human beings <laughs> in your classroom and in your community um, and in, in the world and, and make sure that everybody um, you know, everyone's being treated with equality and respect um, and that youth have power in defining when that's not happening, saying when that's not happening and then problem solving together um, what to do next, right? Like, okay, if this is not happening in our classroom, what are we gonna do about it? And when youth and adults are um, doing that together with shared, shared responsibility and shared power is sort of like, ups the level of <laughs> integrity in what you're trying to work on. And so I, I feel like that has overwhelmingly been the focus of all of our work, no matter what the actual like name of the project is, that has been the ground level rooting of, of everything we've been doing um, within the last two years. And quite frankly, I don't see it changing. Like I, I only see it growing stronger. 
Uh, thanks, Sarah. I definitely have some thoughts related to that. However, I think Monica uh, wants to uh, contribute. Monica. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first of all, this is really exciting for me to see several of my students here um, listening to all of you. And, um, and just FYI, Sarah, um, Lindsay actually zoomed into this equity course. Oh, my- this is the, she told yeah. me about that. Great. It's oh, that's about that's- for learning. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So it's great to meet you because I don't think we've met. I don't know if we have, but um, but anyway, great to see you. And I just wanted to let you know, you know, at the pre-service teacher level, we are, it's very exciting because every time a new, you know, upcoming teacher creates a lesson plan now, they are including the equity competencies. So that's been kind of a big change as far as my practice goes anyway, you know, and making sure that they're explicitly thinking about how to create learning environments that are inclusive of all students. Um, they're explicitly thinking about their implicit biases and you know how they can be more inclusive. Um, culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, we've talked a lot about the equity audits you know, in our classrooms and how we wanna make sure that we have um, multiple voices. Um, and then of course, historically marginalized populations um, and just creating more personalized approaches. So. This is something that has not, in my view, at least maybe from my own perspective, um, you know, really been explicitly added to all of our lessons um, in the past. So it's been really exciting the last several years adding in and knowing that the latest group of new teachers coming out there um, are going to be including this kind of work in their lessons. Uh, thank you, uh, Monica, uh, and thank you, everybody, also for your ideas. I, I want to tag back onto what Sarah was uh, talking about in terms of the dialogue, because uh, I'm working with Sarah in my own classroom, and uh, we've had, I've started a new program this year on sustainability, and I think I mentioned this last month, that it took me a while to realize that sustainability isn't just about the environment or climate or the actions, but it's also about creating sustainable communities that are anti-racist, that are just, and that are based in this social justice and equity work. And uh, as many of us may have been experiencing the uh, in the third year of the pandemic, I think that everybody is at a heightened level. Uh, I can't put my finger on it, but maybe a heightened level of sort of angst, anxiety, aggravation. And we're seeing this in, in student behaviors. And uh, working to create those socially just uh, communities, as Sarah mentioned, with shared power is so important. But I think it also, there's a lot of, it's a very challenging too. And it's how do we create those dialogues? So I just completed my first trimester with seventh and eighth graders, and I've done a feedback, and they said that they want to have these discussions. And the discussions need to be about the important things that they're seeing in the news, they're seeing on social media, uh, because if we're not doing that, then they can they think that we're ignoring sort of it's irrelevant to them. Uh, And the challenge I have is, as Sarah mentioned, how do you teach kids to have dialogue and to have empathy and to be good listeners? Those are really, really high level skills. And for a lot of teach for myself, I'll speak for myself just having kids talking all the time, sometimes it doesn't feel like you're getting anything. You know, there's that old model of we have to be producing, but the talking is what's so important and figuring out how to talk and how to have these dialogues is a challenge that I'm working with Sarah on. Like, how do you structure it? What's the protocol? How do you get it so that kids are leading the conversations? And how do you, more importantly, how do you get it so that kids are choosing what they want to talk about and so that they can address what's happening. And then the, beyond that, that's one challenge that I'm working on, uh, chopping wood on that one. But the other one is once you have those dialogues and kids are telling you what they want to happen, how do you then take action? Like, how are we empowering the kids to take action in partnership so that we're not kind of, I feel like right now, a lot of adults who are working in schools are knocking heads with students around behaviors. Right. And I think what Sarah is talking about is how do we sit down and have those dialogues so that we can create a community that is socially just and equitable that people feel good about. And Maura mentioned in our last uh, conversation about are we creating places of healing? Are we creating places of harm? And if we're going to create schools that are healing kids and loving kids, 
how do we get to that place of shared power through dialogue? And I think really that's um, the challenge that, that I'm, I'm working on right now and implementing that and turning that over to the kids. Uh, and so that's something I'm thinking about just kind of tagging on to, to other folks. Um, I'd, I'd like to welcome Joe and also Amanda. And Joe, do you want to address this prompt? And then I'm gonna sort of open it up from, for any questions from folks uh, around what we've just uh, discussed. Joe? Hi, I'm Joe Rivers from Brattleboro Area Middle School. And I, I guess I would say that, uh, can, can you say again, Don, you were saying something about uh, something through dialogue? What was it? Uh, well, creating shared power through dialogue, but also creating communities that are learning communities that are socially just, empathetic, and that are supporting and, and supportive and inclusive of all the people who are in our in those learning communities. Yeah, I haven't figured out how to do that. I, uh, what um, the closest I can get to something like that is uh, those sorts of things, but through projects. Because uh, for me, we've got to be doing something. If we're if we're uh, sitting and talking, um, then people all have their opinions, and then some are researched in one way, and some are researched in another. And I I struggle with that a bit. I I and so for me, it's been about finding uh, community based projects to try to uh, work together on, and then. Um, try to facilitate those things you were mentioning, the idea of making sure that everyone's included, that uh, stories of the past are not um, discarded, but they're embraced and different versions of stories from the past are also chased and uh, that we're trying to do things in the present uh, to rectify some things in the past that may not have uh, been properly done um, I can work within that context. I think uh, I feel pretty good about that, but it, it's hard for me to to sit in a circle and talk. Um, when the and so I'd be uh, interested in hearing you know, how that plays out. I've done the Socratic method with folks, and and that sort of thing is is based on students having done some research and having some some things to fall back on besides their own opinions, but also being able to pull in information from other sources. And that's not quite the same, I don't think, as, as the dialogue that you're talking about. So I, I'm interested in how that plays out. Uh, I'm interested too, Joe. Um, and I, I will certainly let you know, but uh, again, that's a challenge that I have in, in creating that instruction. Are there folks who have questions about anything they've heard or how this is implemented or any comments? Are we good to move on to the next prompt? Okay. Oh, hold on a second. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. If I don't see you, have a great Thanksgiving. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions I think um, that we should be maybe talking about or addressing uh, I mentioned it briefly, is uh, the fact that we're in the third year of the pandemic and we're talking about dialogue and we're talking about, you know, social justice. Um, we're talking about things that are really difficult because that's what kids are seeing. That's what we're seeing is sort of in the headlines. And those kids are coming. I can't, I don't know what all the kids are, are experiencing outside of school. Most of us uh, can't know, uh, you know, what kids are bringing into the classroom. Uh, but how are kids, uh, how are teachers using sort of trauma informed instruction and social emotional learning pieces uh, in their classrooms now uh, so that you can have these productive, positive learning communities? And what are you doing as an educator to support all students uh, in, in your classroom uh, to get through what is, I think, is probably the toughest thing that we've ever taught through? Um, and so I'd just be very interested to hear how some of our practitioners are uh, addressing those, those challenges as well. Go ahead, Meg. 
Uh, thanks, Anna. I was just actually going to look um, for, uh, Kev has mentioned a title of a book that he read this summer that I keep meaning to go get after these meetings and then I forget. So I need to, I need to get that book. So I was hoping that Kevin would go first and talk about the book. But um, so uh, some of the things, uh, just there, there certainly have been some, uh, I am really trying to be, um, uh, to be calm and to um, uh, take mindful moments as often as I can and really modeling for kids, especially when I'm feeling my own, we have this uh, ridiculous pace in our day um, that uh, feels anti the antithesis to what we learned from the pandemic. So it's frustrating, but it's the reality of what, what we have. And so I'm, I'm trying to, um, like just take a few breathing breaths with kids as at the start of the um the start of the morning like the start of the day sometimes in the middle of class um i we do a lot of we spend a lot of time outside whenever we can for for snack breaks we go on a team walk every morning and um even when it's raining we're just like bundle up and we we kind of make everybody go um and it's it's actually really uh, a lovely way to start the day even when it's a little muddy and raining and um uh so those are just some of the things we have a circle once a week um which i'm new at this at the circle i haven't had a ton of training around it but um but that isn't stopping us from doing it and we try to host a team meeting and we host a team meeting once a week and i think all of those things are helping us to um remind uh kids that we're part of a team and part of a community um and more needs to you know it, we still need to do more um so um we we continue to um even i think the thing that i just want to say is even when it's hard we still do it and that's the part that um i'm i feel good about is that because it would be really easy to just say this is too hard for kids they're disruptive or they don't listen to the instructions and it's like right we just need to keep practicing it with this we keep still need to keep you know having them come together and try to push past the um uh, when it gets challenging or hard. Thank you so much, Meg. Uh, any, Kevin? Yeah, so, I mean, since Meg brought that up, I put it in the chat, the, um, yeah, this book I read over, over the summer really, I, I think, changed the way I thought about a lot of things I do in my practice. It's called Equity-Centered Trauma-Informed uh, Education by Alex Bennett. Uh, she's, she's been in, I actually just watched a webinar with her recently. Um, just a lot with, with obviously trauma informed and equity centered practices. And, you know, it, it's, it's little things that I feel like we have been considering, like even at the start of school year, like the prompts that you're giving kids, like, Hey, how was your summer? Like for kids who undergo trauma, like that could really re-traumatize them in the school year. And it's, you know, she makes the point of, we can't ever assume that, the trauma stops when they enter school and school is a trauma free space. We have to assume and know that trauma happens in school as well. And, and hopefully with that lens, it's changing the way that we're, you know, both working with our students and thinking about our curriculum. Um, another big piece she, she brings up is just this idea of dehumanizing students based on control. I think that's what we're seeing a lot now with some of the behaviors. Cause you know, if you're thinking about behavior as communication, you know, these kids are traumatized through, through this pandemic. I mean, I can't imagine being a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old, having to wear a mask every day and having these different protocols you have to follow. And, you know, a lot of, I mean, behavior is communication. This is how they're communicating that with us. Um, and we started looking at it through that lens and, and bringing the human aspect back, back to reality. It's, it makes it easier to have a conversation with them. And instead of saying, Hey, you need to learn how to cope with a, a, B, and C, it's looking at systems and things that are, are there and saying, wow, yeah, this is hard and accepting that it is hard. And, and instead of, and I feel like we do, do too much with, you have to learn how to cope with what is hard in your life and not enough with just addressing the fact that things are hard and, and hitting it more at the systems level and ha having the kids hear you say that, you know, like 
it, it I think that just changes the conversation and changes the control aspect too. Instead of butting heads with a kid being like, why aren't you sitting in your seat? Or why are you talking when you're not supposed to be talking? It, it just, it definitely changes uh, the perspective there. Um, and in that way too, like she, she gets into a, a piece about how SEL can be weaponized because of that. So really thinking about if we're truly thinking about social emotional learning, who is it for? Um, how are we delivering that, that instruction? Is it all just about how they're coping to deal with stuff? Or are we really thinking about their well-being and, and um, you know, get, getting into some of those, like the five castle standards and whatnot. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, really trying to bring kids and families more into the conversation about decisions we're making. I think, you know, the kids are, are ready to have these conversations at the middle level, especially, you know, at, at the 504 IEP EST levels, you know, we're sitting at a table making all these decisions for the, these kids. Like, how often do you actually go and ask the kid, what do you need from us? And if, you, if you're like, huh, yeah, I, you know, we just had a conversation with all the kids' teachers and their connections, but I actually sit down with the kid or the family and say, hey, what do you need from us to, to be successful or enjoy school more? like all of a sudden that, that switch starts to change and which is going to help foster those relationships. And then you see the snowball effect of, you know, the social justice in the curriculum, like everything builds from that. So it, it really was, I would encourage, if you haven't read the book yet, it really opened my eyes and just made me reflect on the way I was approaching my practices and, and teaching. And, and it was, it was a good, uh, little shock to the system, you know, that I needed for sure. Thank you, Kevin. There's a lot to unwrap there. I also, before I forget, I also just want to make sure that everybody knows that Alex uh, Vanette is going to be the speaker at the Middle Grades Conference. She's the keynote speaker. Uh, so that'll be a great time to hear um, more about what she's doing and her approach. Other folks uh, want to contribute? I'll go. If uh, uh, so, I was listening. It was good. I, I am happy to be here and to listen to these wise people. Uh, it's a it's a highlight of the month. So thank you. Um, as I was listening to what was being said, um, some things we're trying to do is we're trying to take control of our schedule. You know, Meg was talking about how the schedule is crazy, and so. Um, when we get back from this Thanksgiving break until the next break, the next three weeks, we've just chucked the schedule and we've talked with the students about what they need. <laughs> and we're gonna do three weeks of, let's try to figure this out together. Uh, we're not just putting in time here. You know, we, have, we have goals. Our goals as adults is to try to support you and give you opportunities to build skills, to be successful as you move forward how are we gonna do this? Let's, let's start trying to figure it out. So we're having those conversations with students and um, we, we are fortunate enough to have blocks of time where we can change what we're doing. And so we're gonna do that. And uh, then we're gonna process it after three weeks and talk with the students again and see what might need to be different. So um, one of the things that uh, frustrates me is I, what I hear from students in different ways is that we have overpromised as adults, as a culture, as a society, we have overpromised again and again and again. And they um, look at us and we say stuff and they shake their heads and say, BS, you know, that's not what you're saying is not what's happening. There's a disconnect between the messages, our systems, present to students and what their experiences are. And I think that's where a lot of the conflict's coming. Uh, and so that all goes back to relationships again and trying to figure things out together, not present ourselves as we know what's going on, you do what we say and everything's great. That's not, that can't be what we're doing. Uh, there's like a continuum, there's compliance on one end and there's curiosity on the other. And uh, we just seem to be as systems, we're stuck in that compliance end of things, and we're not providing opportunities for students to, to practice curiosity. <laughs> you know, a goal of mine on a daily basis is to get somebody to laugh hard enough that they 
uh, have trouble keeping their mask on. You know, it doesn't, you know, just what's going on, it, what's happening in, you know, in our conversations and what we're doing so that that's an outcome. Uh, there's gotta be more of that instead of less. And um, so the, the other thing that really stresses me right now because of these last couple of years is uh, the information that's coming out uh, with adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs, and the fact that we're all there um, as adults and as children. If we look at those lists and, and how those things um, have an impact on our lives, uh, none of us have been in this position before. And I think if we all work from that given, then we can build things together. You know, I, I've stressed before that concept of emergent learning having things emerge from the experiences we're having in order to build new experiences that incorporate the skills and the practices that we want students to have. Uh, if we enter into teaching with preconceived notions about what's supposed to be the outcome, uh, that's why we're button heads as much as we are. Those are my biases. And um, this, uh, these experiences that we're having during these couple of years haven't really changed those biases much. You know, and I, I think they, these things are exasperating uh, the problems. All right, so change the schedule, change your outlook, listen to them, have conversations with them, create goals together, move forward. Uh, don't put in, if you give them the message that we're just putting in time, and that's what's, that's what's uh, a big problem that there are adults working with students right now that are so frustrated and having such a hard time themselves that they are not um, doing much except putting in their time because that's all they can do. But if that's the message that we're giving the kids, then we're not going to get much back from the students except they're putting in time too. And we're not going anywhere then. Thanks, Joe. Monica? Yeah, I just want to, um, first of all, say with my students who are here, not all of them are middle level educators. Um, some folks are going secondary and some elementary, but, um, but what Joe just said, you know, it reminds us of what we've known for a long time in middle level philosophy, which is it's all about the student needs first, the developmental needs, the content is secondary. And I think with the pandemic, we've really, that's come, hit home to the top. Um, and I also just wanna say, thank you so much to each of you practitioners who are with the kids all day and seeing and recognizing these challenges with COVID. And we have to keep talking about it, that this is primary, um, you know, what they need right now may not be what they needed, you know, what students needed a few years ago. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Monica. Uh Joe, one of the things when we, you know, we talk about uh, the SEL stuff, one of the things uh, we're we take a break every day. We also like Meg, we go walking quite a bit and uh, we do a lot of community walks. And one of the challenges I challenge the kid, hey, can we get up to the Hubbard Park Frog Pond safely? It's amazing how much practice kids need walking, right? Like just to walk in a straight line down the sidewalk. Um, so we, we practice walking a lot, but it's really, I call it a great opportunity to rub shoulders just to kind of jostle and have a low key way of talking. And it's a great way of getting to know your students. Um, when you, you know, you have the opportunity to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations, maybe at the front of the line or, or at the back of the line. The other thing that we've done too, is I moved into a new room this year that has some kitchen area and, uh, there's a kettle in there. And so, uh, we're having tea, and hot chocolate on kind of a regular basis. And it's amazing how tea and hot chocolate actually soothe and calm people. Ooh, 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 can I get some hot chocolate? Yeah, there's some for everybody, uh, but you have to do your dishes. And the kids are like, oh, I can do that. And just kind of uh, allowing kids to sit around and have conversations and enjoy and being kind to each other uh, just through a cup of tea or a cup of hot chocolate uh, has, been, has been really good. Um, the behaviors have been challenging though. And, uh, you know, recently I had an, in, you know, an incident with a kid where I wasn't my best self. And how do you, how do you repair that harm? 
uh, you know, and how do you, when a kid uh, or you are, you know, you're butting heads and, and, and there's kind of that, that moment, how do you go back and repair that? And what, you know, the kids are telling me, it's a lot about communication. It's a lot about consistency. It's about the language that we're using. It's also about the language that kids are using with each other. That's one of the biggest things that I'm seeing right now is the, the language that people are accepting uh, to have around them. And that it's just, it's something that we just got to start talking about and be, and be talking about all the time because the language, and I think that has been exacerbated by the pandemic, what people are willing to say and, and willing to tolerate. And so the language we use, I think, says a lot about the culture we're creating in our educational uh, communities. And so that's also a focus. So for me, it's about creating a lot of outdoor time, uh, a lot of time with uh, unstructured socialization where we still have expectations, but kids can be talking to you or talking to each other without being sort of it, it being schoolified, um, creating moments like with the hot chocolate and tea where we can just come together as a community. Uh, and, then, and then figuring out when there is an incident or when you do uh, get into it with a student. How do we repair that harm in a way that uh, leaves everybody feeling better about the situation? And I think that requires teachers and myself to be vulnerable and to say, hey, you know what? I was wrong on that and I apologize and I'm really sorry. And I think that when you start doing that, I think that the kids aren't, as Joe mentioned, they're not just looking at you and saying, oh, this is BS. They're instead saying, okay, you know, I get it. We were, and, and, and that's happened, you know, with, with these, with the kids too. And I also, you know, somebody said something interesting today. We were watching a video about the UN SDGs and I said, what did you notice about this? And they said, well, everybody's working in groups. And I think getting the group work back into our schools and into our classrooms is really important. I think kids are really missing that. And just, uh, you know, that would be sort of one level up in terms of the socialization. There's a little bit more structure. There's, a, you know, an outcome, hopefully, that the kids have voice and choice in. But providing those opportunities for, for kids, I think, is really important. And we've had some group projects recently where kids have been very uh, grateful for that. And uh, so I think that's also something that we're kind of weaving into uh, what we're doing on a daily basis. Maura, did you have uh, some thoughts on this? Um, it's been so nice to just listen, uh, to this group. So I don't work directly with, um, students, um, but what can I, I can tell you is that, um, I think like most classrooms, um, we have teachers who are really, and students who are really struggling right now. And so we've been, um, at sort of the district and system level, really trying to get curious, um, sort of as Kevin was saying, and really reframing of like, so what, it, you know, what is the behavior communicating? What are, what are students telling us? Um, and then also really thinking about, um, you know, we think a lot about co-regulation. So how do we ensure that our adults have what they need and they're regulated so that they can help co-regulate with students? Um, because I think, I think that's, um, a really important element to this too, that um, our, just as our students are being impacted by year through the pandemic, our, our teachers and their families and, and their extended families, right, are also um, greatly impacted by what's going on. And so really thinking about that um, and not really have any, having any answers and it's so hard. And it, I think a lot of times it feels like we're not getting anywhere or you know, we can't get to the solution, we can't name it. Um, which is really, really hard. But I think um, coming back to, you know, what what are we doing to ensure that people are getting what they need sort of at, at all levels. Um, and one of the highlights of my day where I see sort of the most joy, um, one of the high schools that's on our campus has um, front steps and that's where they take, students can step out and take their mask breaks with their teachers. And just seeing people outside with their masks off and um, smiling and and sort of like having that like exhale moment, like it's so visible and, and really thinking about like, what would it look like to have more centers in our schools that look like that? And how do we keep that, right? Like we have mask breaks right now um, because we have this sort of like physical reminder and, and people need a break. But when we sort of transition, how do we keep these sort of breaks going and making sure that we're getting into outdoor spaces and we're feeling sunshine and doing those things because it, it really does 
make a difference. And I think right now we have the autonomy in classrooms to say like, okay, let's take a break or let's go step outside. And I think we haven't always felt that way. Um, and, and so really thinking about how do we keep that going. Thank you, uh, Maura. That's, again, some great points about that. Uh, we're going to, Monica, I'm going to turn it over to you if you want to ask uh, for some questions. And then the last piece, we're sort of getting down to it here, but the last piece, I just want to ask folks, uh, our practitioners, how you're staying connected. And as Monica, uh, sorry, as Maura mentioned, what are some of the things that you're doing to support yourself or um, to get kind of get you through this? What are those things? Uh, but first, Monica, do you have uh, any questions for us or uh, do your students have any questions for us? Yeah, I just wanna say um, it's so incredible to hear you know, these experts, all these experts, but I also wanna recognize we have these brand new, not even a teacher yet folks here who um, have been thinking about equity, um, thinking about the pandemic. You know, Some have families of their own who are in schools um, and I just wanted to make sure they had some voice today. If there's anything that any of you all want to say, um, Andreas, Michaela, Amanda, Jamie, or Heidi. Andreas? Yeah, um, so I'm in the middle of doing my observing hours. I'm, I'm actually getting towards the end of it. I'm at Fairhaven Union. Um, and what I've been noticing along with everything that the, that's been going on with the pandemic is just a general exhaustion. You know, there's just not a lot of energy to it. And it seems like everybody's kind of slow to coming back. And I notice it too, with even here at college sometimes. And, uh, you know, I worry about it and I worry that this is what, you know, we're going to let the future of our education system is going to look like. So. I, I agree. I agree with what you're saying. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I have an answer to that. One thing when you talk about energy, I think about game based learning. And, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a lot with games and gaming and kind of, uh, again, that's a way of bringing some joy uh, into the classroom, just some plain old fun. Uh, Joe talked about having a kid laugh so hard their mask comes off. And we've started playing kickball a little bit. And we had an incident today where the teacher may or may not have made a big error in the field. And uh, it got one kid laugh. This is a kid who doesn't laugh in class. And this kid was laughing so hard. She, she tears were streaming down her face and that's like a win, you know? And again, if Joe, I think what Joe is right, if we can have kids just laughing like that, I think Andreas that brings some of that energy back, but I too am feeling that as well. Anybody else have questions or observations? Um, Amanda? Hi, um, I know that like same thing with Andreas, like I've noticed in like my school, like where I'm observing, like sometimes like she, the teacher really just has to encourage the students to like, you know, just push through the last, you know, like half hour or whatever, because they're just like getting tired and like, you can just see it like on their faces and just like the lack of energy sometimes. So sometimes she'll do like, you know, mental breaks too and like just play a game with them for like five or 10 minutes to kind of just pick them up and help them get through it. Thank you. Uh, Meg, Joe, uh, Maura, do you have any, you know, if you feel low energy in your classroom, how are you addressing that? Um, uh, Don, I, um, I feel like the, the, our schedule is so like fast that I feel like sometimes I don't have that, um, I don't have time, like we don't, we don't have time to like, um, get tired, but, um, so I guess I would just say, I try to get them, you know, an outside brain spark is the, you know, moving our body. Sometimes I'll do yoga with them and I'll just try to get them to like, move to get that energy going back again. I totally feel the fatigue. I think something that helps center me, and, uh, and I, I think I mentioned this last week, but it's just that, that networking, like trying to, trying to keep my door open sometimes and just like reaching out, like 
you know, just trying to get the, the network of support of teach of the adults that are in um, that are with me so that um, sometimes we can find a good chuckle out of something uh, that helps us just laugh at ourselves, laugh at the at the mistakes that we make, uh, um, you know, if we step in it a little bit. And um, if we're laughing, sometimes that just shows the kids that we're, you know, we're here, we're having a good time, we're, we're trying to do the best that we can. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's a, a great observation. Uh, Andreas, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to cut anybody off, but, um, there's a now Monica and some of my classmates are well familiar with this scenario, but I'm from Sparta, New Jersey, and I went to Sparta High. And what happened back home was that there was a new class that was implemented. It was a gender studies class, and it was headed by a teacher who was very renowned, very well loved in the school. And the board specifically instructed her not to implement certain types of materials, certain books. And she didn't feel that that was particularly right. And she implemented the books anyway. And she had actually gotten put on probation for this. And I want to know if like, what would be like a general response to if you're instructed by the board about something that you feel in your heart is right? Maura? Yeah, it's a really, really great question. And I think um, I think we're seeing different things happening at, at board levels right now um, and in communities sort of everywhere. And, and there's a lot of like misinformation if we think about like, um, you know, people um, feeling like critical race theory shouldn't be taught in schools, for example, when we know critical race theory is a legal framework that's used and applied in education to think about equitable systems um, and is not um, curriculum, for example. And so I think one of the things like there's a real power in, um, in teachers coming together, but then also thinking about um, at the board level, like what are the policies that are in place? And as teachers, you know, getting to know some of those policies, which is not something that sort of teachers always um, have a role in. And I think um, unions are also really helpful there too in helping to navigate. And so thinking about like, who are your um, supporters and working closely with your superintendent. Um, but I think boards right now are really grappling with that. Um, in Vermont, if you haven't looked it up, the Vermont School Boards Association, Superintendents Association, VPA and VCSEA put out a joint statement really defining um, equity at the policy level, um, because what you're sort of defining is more of like a, it, it is directly connected to policy because boards um, deal with, with policy. And so if you haven't looked at that definition yet um, and looked at some model policies, that would be a really great exercise for your class to sort of go through and think about like if it was in Vermont, sort of what would be the next step, um, but it's a really great question and it is a, a complexity to something that um, you know we're, we're, we're working sort of up against um, and it's a challenge right now. Thank you. Uh, Jamie? Yeah I have a question similar to Andreas. I was just wondering like regarding the incorporation of the social justice piece how are families and parents reacting to this like I was just wondering if they're, for the most part, supportive. Um, I'm from a pretty small Vermont town, and for Black Lives Matter specifically, I know some parents are very strongly opinionated on that such perspectives and stories like that shouldn't be incorporated in school. So I was just wondering if what to do if parents are against stuff like that. Well, I so last year uh, I can just kind of talk a little bit about the strategies as a teacher that I used last year. Uh, we had some social justice reading groups and I took all the books home and I read them and uh, they, uh, they were riddled with the N word. And I was like, Holy smokes, I can't, uh, first of all, I need to, I think I had given the parents uh, sort of a letter saying, this is what we're doing and this is the expectation and this is why we're doing it. And then I, I sent that out to the parents and then when I saw the language that was being used, 
I actually got in touch with some community members who helped me design uh, some dialogues about not only about race and racism, but also there was a um, there was a column in the New York Times last year, and it was called "Why the N Word is Unsayable," and we made that our uh, the title of a kind of a seminar discussion that we had, and so we you know my strategy is always to make sure the parents are aware of what's happening, give them the opportunity to opt out uh, if they want. I mean you know, obviously I think that all kids should be hearing this, but a lot of this also stemmed from the fact that when I asked kids, if they had heard the N word at school, every single one of them raised their hand, every single one of them. And, and I at sort of continued to ask that question. And it's not just in middle school. This is like elementary school. They're being exposed to this kind of language. And, you know, I, and then I asked an expert to come in and help me structure the lecture because you know, that's when you start thinking, I am a, a, a white male, pretty much privileged white male, the archetype. Um, and so what do I know about that? What do I carry? What mistakes am I going to make if I'm the only one who's designing this lesson? So you bring in a lot of different folks. And I also had kids of uh, color in those classes. So I reached out to those parents personally, and I talked to them about that uh, just to make sure that you're not doing harm. And I think uh, there's a lot of preparation that needs to go into them. Uh, but the other piece to it, too, is if you read the headlines on the front pages, right? Again, if we're not talking about these things, then kids are looking at you and saying, you know, you're acting as if it doesn't matter or if it's not the real world. And that, I think, divorces kids from the purpose of an education just as much as any of the systems that Joe was mentioning, the schedules or the disparate expectations that we have for them. Other folks want to contribute to that to that one? I was just going to say we have a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, uh, we have, we've having some struggles at the district. I'm not sure if you follow in the news, but um, uh, we do have a dedicated group of parents and teachers that meet once a month to talk about these things. And I think that that's been really helpful to just um, parents are hearing what teachers are struggling with and teachers are hearing what parents want and need. Obviously, we're all uh, the folks that are dedicated to that work are um, are more in alignment philosophically around it, but it helps as teachers to just reassure that there are folks in our community that, that back up this work and our principals on board and um, our district has a policy. So that uh, all of that helps to just help us to continue to do the work. And, and as Don said, uh, communicate and the kids are really good communicators around that just even I feel like sometimes the students just sharing with their folks here's my identity poster on gender identity or here's my identity poster on racism that uh, that has helped to or racial identity sorry um, is just give pulls them into the loop without you know um, necessarily having all the information but it's we're not hiding it, right? Like we're, we're, it's right out there. And I think uh, transparency as best as we can helps um, diffuse some of the tension. Thank you very much. I do wanna be mindful of our time. I know it's the Thursday before the Friday before the Thanksgiving break. And I think that, uh, I know that everybody I've talked to is very, very happy about the coming vacation. Um, so, what I'd like to ask uh, people to do just as a way of closing our meeting today is in the chat, if you can just write something you're grateful for or you're looking forward to. I do also uh, wanna thank uh, Monica for bringing your students. I really appreciate it. And also for your questions and contributions, that's awesome. And just also a reminder that uh, the Middle Grades Conference is happening on January 29th from nine to one. Uh, it's online, and Alex uh, Vanette is going to be the uh, key speaker addressing trauma-informed instruction and social-emotional uh, teaching. So that'll be worth your while. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. I hope you have a fantastic Thanksgiving uh, with loved ones, that you get to take some time off to do what you love to do. And if you can, uh, just put in the chat one thing that you're grateful for or you're looking forward to, uh, we'll close it out.
thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, you're the best. This is one of my support groups, and I deeply appreciate all your work. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a joy to see you all. I know. So good to see you, Mon. How are you? Good. Hey, good. man. Good. Monica, and I was thinking we, Monica, we should have invited Nancy uh, Rupert. I know. That would have been awesome. Oh, that would have been so fun. I know. Uh, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to get her on. Um, That'd be great. Just to the to all of you, I just want to say thank you so much for continuing with this project. I feel like our conversations are getting, I don't know, really super incisive. And uh, it really makes me, it's they're just getting better and better. And it makes me a uh, much better teacher just listening to what everybody has to say. And uh, it's great. You guys are my, are my peer support group for sure. Uh, and I really appreciate everything that you're bringing to the table. Always grateful. Always grateful. Hey, stay out of the stone corral there, O'Donnell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went in there and they got a brass nameplate right on right <laughs> on the front first Meg O'Donnell's seat. Yep. That's right. All right. Have a good one, folks. All right. Bye, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Yep. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.